How can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Can you uh, yeah. staple it? Thank you. So Johnny Jiko sent me an email asking for weekly meeting. So I told him we can have monthly meeting at the beginning and then we can switch to weekly meeting. And so if you have any questions, you can just directly contact Jiko. Okay. I don't have to be okay. Okay. meeting. Yeah. 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 That's okay. okay. Yeah, that's fine. Just one of the two places. <coughs> So assignment two is already up. Uh, you might have seen it. Okay. <laughs> Can you staple it? You don't have a stapler? Anyone has a stapler? Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, another announcement is that I'll be out of town on 25th. I'll be attending Allerton Conference at UIUC. So 27th is your exam. I'm out on that particular day also. So I'll hold some office hours on 24th. Uh, so you, if you have any questions for the exam, you can come and talk to me. Not exam, I think it's a quiz. So you can come and talk to me in my office hours. I'll send out an announcement uh, later on uh, when I'm available for office hours. Is anyone else going for Allerton Conference? No one? OK. All right, so I think we can get started. Uh, today, we are going to discuss conjugate gradient method. So. It's also another form of gradient descent method. Uh, it's also another form of gradient descent method, but specialized for quadratic programming problems. Uh, and the problem setup is as follows. I want to conjugate gradient method. I want to minimize half x transpose qx minus b transpose x, x in Rn. Q is a positive definite matrix. So this is a convex problem.
So this is a convex problem because if I take the second derivative of, so the first derivative of the function is qx minus b and the second derivative of the function is q which is strictly positive definite for all values of x. So therefore it's a convex function. Okay, so I'm doing an unconstrained minimization of a convex function. So what do we already know about convex functions? Derivative equal to zero is a sufficient condition. So x star optimal if and only if gradient f at x star equal to zero, this implies that q x star minus b equal to zero, which implies x star equal to q inverse of b. Okay, so it's easy to, fa to, well, not easy, but as you can see, computation of the optimal value just requires an inversion of a matrix multiplied by a vector. So why do we need an algorithm for that? Any thoughts? Yes, so computing Q inverse is an expensive affair, uh, especially when n is very, very large. So think of n being, this n being a million, okay? In which case, computing Q inverse becomes a formidable challenge. More importantly, for many applications, you may not necessarily be looking for exact value of x star, you are happy with some approximate value of x star, okay? so. You don't want to go through the pain of computing Q inverse and then multiplying it by a vector in order to compute X star, as long as you can compute an approximation of uh, X star, okay? So if you have an iterative algorithm uh, that solves this optimization problem, you can perhaps terminate it much earlier and it can give you an approximately optimal solution if the derivative, first derivative is small enough, okay? So all you need to check is if the first derivative is small, you can just stop the computation. You don't have to move forward because you know you are very close to X star in that case. You are approximately optimal. So one idea is to use gradient descent, vanilla gradient descent, uh, but that's not very fast. We can perhaps come up with a more intelligent algorithm uh, using the concept of conjugate vectors uh, that you had uh, done in your assignment and see what the properties of that particular algorithm is. So the idea is let D1 to D, Dn in Rn be Q conjugate vectors, which implies that di transpose q dj is equal to zero for all i not equal to j. And the algorithm we propose is pick x1 arbitrarily and then we have xk plus 1 equals xk plus alpha k dk. Now all we need to pick is an appropriate choice of alpha k.
we'll get to the process of computing the Q conjugate vectors in a bit. But for the time being, just assume that you're given a set of Q conjugate vectors, which means that they satisfy this relationship. You pick X1 arbitrarily, you run through this iteration. We still need to figure out how to pick alpha K. And then hopefully you can terminate at some point of time, um, which will be an approximately optimal solution or perhaps even the optimal solution uh, for this optimization problem. Okay, any question? No. What do you think should be an appropriate choice of alpha k? So we have had many different choices of alpha k so far. Constant gradient or the, or the gradient at x naught. Sorry? The gradient at x naught. Gradient at x naught. Yeah. Uh, where, where we don't have gradient here at this point of time. I mean to be constant because this is a quadratic loss function. Right. So we can make the gradient to be constant. The alpha k to be equal to the constant at the gradient point. Uh, alpha k is a scalar, so I don't know where, how you are using gradient. So are you taking the norm of the gradient or? Yeah, the norm. Uh, no. Uh, that's not a good choice of alpha k. In fact, that choice was never talked about when we discussed appropriate choices of step size. Remember, there was constant step size, there was decreasing step size, there was minimization rule, limited minimization rule, and Armijo's rule. Those were the five step size selection methods we had talked about. So let's use alpha k according to the minimization rule. So I minimize. alpha in R, okay? So not alpha in zero infinity, but alpha in R. Okay? Let's see what value of alpha this yields. Oh, this is not min actually, this is argument. So alpha is a scalar, this function yields a scalar value. So therefore, uh, I can take the first derivative with respect to alpha and set it equal to zero in order to find a candidate minimum uh, for this particular minimization problem. But one thing that you should note is this particular function is also quadratic in alpha and therefore, it's, this is also a convex function of alpha. This whole thing is a convex function of alpha. And therefore, uh, uh, I can find uh, the optimal value of alpha just by taking the first derivative with respect to alpha. So let's try and do that. Uh, so f of x plus, let me do it on this side. So f of x plus alpha d, d over d alpha is given by gradient f at x plus alpha d transpose d. Okay, so this is equal to q x plus alpha q d minus p. transpose t. What does this give me? So I have d transpose qx plus alpha d transpose qd minus b transpose t. Okay, is this step clear to everyone? Uh, 
okay so at the value of the optimal alpha this derivative should be equal to 0 right so I'm saying this function this whole function is a convex function of alpha I want to find the minimum all I have to do is uh, set the derivative equal to 0 and find the opt optimal value of alpha at which the derivative goes to 0 so let's try and do that I have d transpose qx plus alpha star d transpose qd minus b transpose d equal to 0 which implies that alpha star is equal to d transpose b minus qx over d transpose qd. Can you guys see it? No? I'll write it here. So alpha star is equal to d transpose b minus qx over d transpose qd. Okay. Yes. This yeah. uh, higher dimensional I'm trying to think. So the cross section of it looks like ellipse. So is the cross section of paraboloid an ellipse? Oh. I, I don't I don't know. So this function would look something like something like this. Yeah, so this is your x, f of x, and this is, well, this is x1, and this is x2, and this is f of x. So it looks like a paraboloid. So you're, for that, you're taking a cross-section? Yes, yeah, so you are taking a cross-section, yeah. <clears throat> so we'll get to the picture in a bit. Okay, so my alpha k is equal to, I'm going to substitute dk and xk there. So dk transpose b minus qxk over dk transpose qdk. <coughs> so this is my step size rule. Yes. This one? So x transpose qd and d transpose qx are the same thing. Okay. Uh, I actually want, wanted to write this as d transpose b. So that way I can take d transpose common and write it in terms of b minus qx. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so what are we doing in this particular algorithm? So this is the, this is the conjugate, conjugate gradient method. Uh, I start with a quadratic function. I don't want to solve this uh, matrix inverse problem, inversion problem. Um, I want to do it using a computational, computationally simpler method. So I need a set of Q conjugate vectors uh, how to compute Q conjugate vector, this was part of the assignment, so you already know how to compute it. Uh, I pick X1 arbitrarily, I descend, or I, I run this iteration XK plus alpha K DK where alpha K is picked according to the minimization rule and you actually have a closed form expression for alpha K and this, computing this just requires matrix multiplication but no matrix inversion, okay. So this is a vector, this is a vector, uh, this is 
dk transpose matrix multiplied by dk. So this is also an easy computation. So computing this part is very easy, just plain matrix multiplication. And then I just have to multiply it by dk and then uh, add it to xk and that gives me xk plus one. I can keep doing it iteratively until at some point of time, this is the gradient of f at xk, that goes to zero. So yeah. So the dk is far from that. Yeah. Right, right. So what are we doing uh, in this particular problem? I have, I started from this x1. Let's say d1 is in this direction. Um, I can also go in the negative d1 direction. And I have a function that looks like this. I am looking at a cross section of this function, so that cross section might look something like this. Okay, so this is my x1 here, and I'm looking at the cross section in the direction of, so this is x1 plus d, and this is x1 minus d. So I'm looking at these, this cross section of the function in both direction, and I'm trying to find a value of alpha at which this function is minimized, okay? This, this, just looking at the cross section where this function, the cross section function is minimized. Let's say I get this value of alpha. This is my alpha k dk. And then at this point, I expand this particular manifold in this direction. This is my dk plus one. And, and then I'm looking at the cross section of the function here, and then I want to minimize the function along this particular cross section, okay? So by successively expanding the direction and finding the minimum of the function, you get to the optimal point in an iterative fashion. Okay, let me go over it once, once more. So this is my function, this is my x1, which I've picked arbitrarily, this is my d1. The d1 direction Okay, I look at the cross section of the function in the direction of x1 plus d1 and x1 minus d1. Okay, these two lines are going all the way to infinity. Uh, and I want to minimize the function. Uh, so you look at the cross section of the function, which looks like this, and you want to find the point right here at the minimum. And that's what we are doing by solving this uh, minimization solving this minimization of the function xk plus alpha dk as a function of alpha. And so we started at x1, oh, maybe I should draw it here. So this is the cross section of the function, this is my x1, and this is my d1 minus d1, and I, I want to minimize this function by picking an appropriate value of alpha one, d1, such that x1 plus alpha one, at x1 plus alpha one, d1, this function is minimized, okay? And then I expand the manifold along the conjugate direction, the d2 direction, And then I minimize the function along that direction. And I do this iteratively. Um, and the theorem is this would converge after n steps. So xn equals to x star. So after n steps, you get to x star if you run this algorithm iteratively. Or maybe xn plus one.
Okay, so that's the result. Any any questions? Yes. Uh, after uh, the first uh, iteration, uh, when we expand, uh, when we uh, navigate the uh, first cross section, uh, right. the second uh, manifold uh, that we expand that starts from the optimal point of that. Surface. Yes, of that particular cross section. Yes. So one of the intermediate result of this particular proving this fact is the following, which answers your question. So define MK equals to X1 plus beta 1 D1 beta K DK. Okay. So I pick, uh, so this is the subspace, this is the set of all x that can be written as x1 plus some uh, scalar beta1 multiplied by d1 all the way up to some scalar beta k multiplied by dk. Okay, so this would be a, this would be a, uh, so in three dimensional space, it would be a, m1 will be a line, m2 would be a plane, and m3 would be a solid space. Okay, so if n equals to 3, m1 is a line passing through x1, m2 is a plane passing through x1 and m3 would be R3, okay? Because these are uh, mutually independent vectors, so therefore you span the entire space when you go to M3. So an intermediate claim is that XK equals to argument F of X, X in MK, or XK plus one, is argument of the function when x is in mk. <coughs> yes? Uh, another question on the geometry of things. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, I have a 10 parameter hyperplane mm -hmm. or 12 parameters. So every time I am uh, navigating in 12 mutually orthogonal directions. Well, yeah, orthogonal, but in this sense, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, in a way, I will arrive at the uh, solution in 12 iterations. That's right, at the exact solution. But you can be approximately optimal in 10 or 9 or 8 iterations. Okay, yes. So, so does that mean in this like, bowl problem that you're drawing in three dimensions, we're going to converge in only three iterations? Three iterations, yeah, okay. yeah. But of course, in three dimension, computing the matrix inverse is pretty simple. So there is no computational benefit, but one million dimensional, there is computational benefit. Any other question? Okay, yeah. No, there is no way to best pick x1. Now, of course, if you run this iteration on a specific problem for, I don't know, hundreds of times, you will have some experience about what a good value of x1 would be. But for a generic function, it, there is no way to figure out what an appropriate value of x1 should be. It shouldn't be problematic, though. Right? Sorry? That should, your initialization shouldn't be problematic, though, right? Uh, no, the initialization doesn't matter. It's yeah. You might take longer steps in the beginning. Let's say you have a bad initial condition. This alpha k would be pretty large at the beginning, and then, of course, it will become smaller and smaller at ti as time progresses. Okay. So the only problem that we are left with now is to have a more efficient way of computing 
d1 to dn, right? Uh, so I want to get some ideas. Let's say you are the first person to have thought about this Q conjugate vectors and a way to solve this problem. How would you go about picking d1 to dn in a more computationally efficient manner? Sorry? No, Gram Schmidt is of course one way to do it. But remember for it start, for initializing the Gram Schmidt you need the vector C1, C2 all the way up to Cn, right? So what would be an appropriate or rather a, a natural choice of C1 to Cn? So Right. Uh, well, what do you mean by orthonormal vectors? Uh, the ones which have length one. Uh -huh. Those could be one choice. Okay. And, and I'm, I'm kind of looking at this formula of alpha star. Right. And d d transpose q c that can be uh, if if that is same for all vectors in the. Okay. Okay. Um, how would you? Identify orthonormal set of vectors. Mm, I've read about some procedures about that. For example, there are some. So there has to be some comp some amount of computation done for that. Uh, any other way? Standard basis. So that's standard basis. Any other idea? You had an idea, Yanzong. One zero zero. Okay. Uh, okay. Any other idea? Isn't there something with, like the eigen decomposition with Q? Uh, too too computationally intensive. Okay. Think one million. Okay. Think one million dimension, and so then you will get some natural ideas. Okay. How about the gradient of function, gradient of f x k? Because we have to compute it anyways in order to know whether we are at a minimum or not. Right. So. That's an easy way of computing the Q conjugate vector. So let me write it down. So I'm going to pick D1 equals to minus gradient of Fx1. And this is required because this is my so this is equal to b minus q x1. Okay, I need it because I need to do this computation, right? So I'm just going to pick d1 to be equal to b minus q x1. Uh, so this is also my c1. My c2 would be minus gradient of f x2 equals to b minus q x2 and so on okay Okay, now I can compute D2 using the fact that C1 is given by this expression and then C2 is given by this expression and I do need to compute this anyways because I want to know whether I'm at a minimum or not and it's required for the computation of alpha k. So I'm going to compute D2 and what would D2 look like? It will be minus G2 or minus G1, no. Well, let me define gk 
as gradient of f at xk. And then my dk can be given by minus gk plus beta k dk minus 1. dk plus 1, yeah, where beta k is given by gk transpose gk over gk minus 1 transpose gk. Okay, so let's uh, go back to our train of thought. We need to compute the Q conjugate vectors. Uh, a natural choice for computing Q conjugate vectors would be to use the gradient of the function at specific values x1, x2, x3 because we need to do that computation anyways in order to get the value of alpha k. So so we can get C1, C2, C3 and all that stuff. But from that, we need to extract the Q conjugate vector. So how would we do that? Well, if you go through that entire derivation, this is the update equation for computing dk plus 1 from gk and dk, okay? where beta k is given by this expression. So this is a vector, easy to compute. This is a, a multiplication or inner product of two vectors, easy to compute, inner product of two vectors, easy to compute. This is addition of two vectors, easy to compute. So dk plus one is easy to compute. Substitute dk plus one or whatever dk here, you get the value of alpha k. Take a step, xk plus alpha k dk, you get xk plus one. Go through this again and you will compute dk plus two and you can go back and forth uh, in this particular algorithm. Okay, so this is the method to compute Q conjugate vectors, and this is the method to compute alpha k, all of which requires matrix multiplication, and then this is matrix addition, and you get x2 and x3 and x4 and so on. Okay, so no matrix inversion whatsoever, uh, no computation of uh, orthonormal basis or anything of that sort. Uh, what happens if I use unit vectors? So what if my C1, C2, these were, this was, uh, many people suggested that we can use C1, C2 as unit vectors. Uh, would that simplify the computation by any way? Let me think. No, I think this computation will be a bit more involved. Plus, you still need to figure out what B minus QX2 is going to be because that's needed for alpha K computation. So it seems like if you use unit vectors, of course, it will be simpler. I mean, it will be simple. It won't require a lot of complicated computation. But perhaps you still need to compute some of these terms nonetheless. So why not just use that information? to compute the Q conjugate vectors. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay. So what have we done so far? 
we have a quadratic optimization problem we wanted to solve, very high dimensional problem. Uh, we figured out that we can use this Q conjugate vectors in order to do the computation, which iteratively minimizes the function over specific manifolds at every point of time. So at n plus 1th iteration, you are exactly at the optimal solution, no matter what happens in between. Uh, your alpha k is picked according to minimization rule. In order to compute Q conjugate vectors efficiently, you use the gradient information to do that, and you have an iterative scheme to compute the Q conjugate vectors. At any point of time, the gradient vanishes, so this term becomes equal to zero. You are exactly at the optimal point, so there's nothing much to be done anymore. Um, however, if this term is very small, you can choose to terminate or you can choose to go ahead and do the computation all the way until the end, okay? But you have an option of terminating the algorithm much earlier if you think that this term is sufficiently small for your application, okay? So that's the idea of gradient, conjugate gradient method, yeah. So this whole method is just for one f of x? Yes, like yes, so that's right. It's very, so it's like very common for people to run into this problem? Uh, yes, in statistics, this kind of problem is, where, oh, the problem is erased. Yeah, so the quadratic minimization problem is pretty common in statistics. So it's just like least square problem that we mentioned Gauss-Newton method in the previous class. So uh, least square problem is used in parameter estimation in many, uh, many cases where the system is unknown, so you, uh, if you want to do system identification, uh, I don't know if you've taken EC3551, but if you want to do some parameter estimation, you can use the least square method to do it. It's just one of the methods to do it, okay? Yeah. Um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, 1950s and 60s and 70s, people were looking at quadratic optimization problems a lot for the parameter estimation problems, yes. Uh, oh, this should be GK plus one? Yeah, because if K equals to one, then both of them are So what is D1? D1 is, D1 is G1 or minus G1. Then D2 is, min oh yeah, that's right. So then this should be GK plus one plus one GK GK plus one. Is that right? Yeah, I think this is correct. Uh, let me go over it once again. So this is minus G2. So if I want to find D2, then it's minus G2 plus beta into D1. Yeah, okay, so this is fine. Okay. <clears throat> so make a change. Uh, this should be GK plus one and then this should be GK plus one. Uh, denominator would be GK transpose GK plus one. Thanks, uh, Johnny, for pointing it out. Okay. Now you can apply this method to nonlinear optimization as well, but there is a small twist in nonlinear optimization, and I want to write that part here. So if you have a non-convex optimization, so you want to minimize uh, f of x, x in Rn, you still have alpha k equals to argument of f xk plus alpha dk, alpha in R, but your 
beta k plus 1 is given by gradient of f transpose Okay, so this is a hack that seems to have worked well in practice. So you compute gk by taking the gradient of the function. Uh, you compute, they won't be q conjugate because there is no q function here, but you compute dk plus 1 in accor according to this particular fashion, and then you take alpha k according to the line, the minimization rule, and you iteratively compute the optimal solution, you are not guaranteed to converge in n steps in this case. Okay, you might have to go to uh, many, many steps before you can actually converge in this general minimization problem. <coughs> okay. Any other question? <coughs> so let's see what uh, this algorithm is trying to do. Uh, in the general case, you have these function so f equals to 1, f equals to 2, f equals to 3. And you are at some point, and this is the optimal point x star. So these are the points of x at which the function value is equal to 1. These are the points of x at which the function value is equal to 2. This is x star, this is your x1, where you started with. And let's say this is your d1 uh, direction that you have picked. So that's negative of gradient of the function at x1. If you pick this alpha k according to the minimization rule, you will arrive at this particular point, OK? This will be your x2. Why? Because the function, as you can see, if you go in this direction, the function will be, the value of the function will increase. On the other hand, at this point, the value of the function will decrease by 1. At this point, the value of the function will decrease by 2. And this is the point at which it's going to, this line is going to barely touch the function f equals to, let's say, 0 0.5 line or, or contour. And then, of course, the function value will start increasing all, all the way to uh, maybe plus infinity. So therefore, your choice of alpha k should be such that your x2 will be equal to x1 plus alpha 1 d1. Okay. Now next time, you will come up with the other direction, uh, let's say d2, and and then you will have to again do the computation uh, of this particular alpha k again. Now, the problem in this situation, in the general function, is that you're not really computing the q conjugate vectors. 
So you're not guaranteed to decrease the value of the function at all points of time. However, if you are in a quadratic situation, which was the original problem we started with, your d2 direction will actually be inwards, okay? And so at every point of time, you are d2, so this is d2 in quadratic case. This is d2 in general case, general non-convex. So in the quadratic case, you're always in a direction so that you get closer and closer to x star. In a non-quadratic, non-convex case, which is the case right here, uh, even with this choice of beta k, you still have to worry about the fact that uh, uh, you may not be always reducing the value of the function uh, and, and that's, the, that's just a limitation and therefore you probably should uh, use with caution uh, algorithms of this type for non-convex optimization problems, okay? So the fact that d1 to dn are q conjugate is very useful in quadratic optimization problem because you're always reducing the value. But in non-quadratic optimization problems, uh, you may get into trouble if you use this particular algorithm. So you might want to stick to gradient method or uh, Newton's method and not use conjugate gradient method. But if you have to use it, I don't know why, but if you have to use it, the book gives you some helpful tips on making sure that your algorithm converges by smaller tricks one of which is picking beta k plus one according to this fashion. Okay? All right. So in the next class, so this is, this is the end of conjugate gradient method. In the next class, I'm going to talk about quasi-Newton method. And the idea in quasi-Newton method is as follows. Uh, you want to minimize a general non-convex function like this, and you want to apply Newton's method, okay? But Newton's method requires you to compute the second derivative inverse at every point of time, okay? And that's a computationally expensive affair. So what I'm going to do is use the past gradient information and past step size information in a fashion so that I could compute the second derivative inverse using a simple matrix computation, okay? And that gives rise to what is known as quasi-Newton method because you're not using the exact second derivative inverse, but you are approximating it using the information you have stored from the past, okay? And you are updating the second derivative inverse in an iterative fashion as you move into the uh, algorithm uh, so that you get the speed up uh, that Newton's method enjoys, but at the same time, not worry about computing the second derivative and invert it at every point of time, okay? So it's a very powerful method. Uh, for some reason, it's not very popular nowadays, but when it was proposed in around 1970s or 80s, uh, it was uh, really a very cool method to do optimization, but uh, perhaps some people are still using it, but I don't see it too much in literature, in the optimization literature anymore. But anyways, we'll talk about quasi-Newton method in the next class. So uh, see you on Friday.